Thank you so much, everybody. Very kind. Um, I hope you're having a fabulous afternoon. Was the cake good? Yeah. Fabulous. I trust you on that one. So it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to uh, be able to introduce to you our wonderful exhibition, Van Gogh and the Avant-Garde. Of course, the modern landscape is really the important part, because I'm sure you've seen wonderful exhibitions featuring Van Gogh's paintings already, haven't you? Yes, you have. Now, what is so special about this exhibition? Everything. How many of you consider themselves very strong in art history? Okay. So, you're in the right place. <laughs> I'm just going to give you a few coordinates, right? You're going to see the exhibition in person in like 45 minutes, so there's no point for me to take you through room by room and preempty the beauty you're going to see, because it's going to be there. But I can give you some context so that we can all piece together the important parts of Van Gogh's life, and not just Van Gogh, uh, that made this exhibition so groundbreaking. There is actually a point at which I was like, wow, this is so important, just to the history of Impressionism and post-Impressionism. And of course, you've not been told that before you can access the galleries, you'll have to sit a test. <laughs> right? We'll come around. Pencil and paper, multiple option, right? <laughs> 10 minutes, and then who passes goes to the exhibition. That was the caveat. So, without any further ado, the exhibition focuses on a very important moment in the history of what we call post-impressionism. Post-impressionism comes after <coughs> Impressionism. And I'm going to give you a few dates so that you can situate both moments in the history of art correctly. I'm not calling them movements for a reason. I'm going to explain that too. Van Gogh, of course, Seurat, Signac, Bernard, and Agnard are the stars of the exhibition. And you probably wonder why? Couldn't there be somebody else that's missing? Where's Monet? He's not there because there's so much Monet elsewhere. <laughs> These artists were doing something really important. 1886, 1888. These artists were moving past Impressionism. Monet didn't like that. You can imagine why. And I'm going to show you when Impressionism comes to an end, who's responsible for that. Monet was the one who got upset. That's... <laughs> That's just the way it went. But how did this very moment where these five artists came together change the history of art? Perhaps we can argue even more than Impressionism had already changed the history of art. So that's where the exhibition is really groundbreaking and it's really one of a kind. It will help you to piece together very important aspects of what makes modern art so special. None of the painters we've looked at right now Hang in there. This is about the context, right? Landscape. This is what landscape looked like before the Impressionists turned it all up upside down. I'm going to give you dates. 1874, 1886. That is Impressionism. We're going to go back to these dates because I want you to pass the test, right? But just bear them in mind. Look at this. 1816. Constable. Pioneer of landscape painting. Britain painted outdoors, something that the Impressionism loved, something that post-Impressionist artists love too. Now, Constable had a bit of a vice, a little bit of a um, kind of notiness. Beautiful, beautiful landscapes, right? Turner painted also outdoors. They were pioneering new techniques. You will remember Turner and Constable looked at clouds and lighting from a very different perspective. But... Constable especially didn't like one thing. Factories. Factories that were popping up a little bit everywhere. The tradition that Constable and also Turner to a certain degree um, was drawing from came from the classical work of Claude Lorraine, for instance, or Poussin. These are the incredible masters in the history of classical landscape. Classical landscape is all about idealization. When was the last time you sat down among ruins writing your diary, surrounded by these beautiful trees, 
preferably in Greece, <laughs> preferably, right? Idealization, that was the key in classical painting, a tradition that develops with the Renaissance, we're looking at the 1400s, all the way up to the 19th century until this happens. It makes you appreciate today's cities so much more, right? The Industrial Revolution, the Industrial Revolution changes everything. And when we say that it changes everything, it really changes everyday life. The working classes, uh, children are used as workforce. Imagine, today we get confused about AI. The new iPad scares us. What functions have they changed that I will have to learn? Lives for these people changed dramatically almost overnight. And it was very much represented by artists that came at the same time as Impressionism was developing and also thereafter. Do you remember this painting? Where, where is it? Good. First tick. We're passing. Now, this is beautiful. If anyone ever approaches you in this museum or outside and tries to sell you a ticket to time travel to 1877 Paris, what do you say? Good answer, no thank you. Because this is not what all of Paris looked like. Right? The Impressionists were very selective. They pieced together a very idealized version of Paris where the cute cafes and the beautiful social spots where people gathered and enjoyed the sunshine existed. They're not lying between their teeth like Constable. Constable was removing factories from the landscape. Like he was just like photoshopping. He invented Photoshop. You can put it that way. <laughs> but beyond the Industrial Revolution that was turning everything upside down, there was also this thing called the Hausmannization of Paris. The Hausmannization of Paris was, let's call it a process of redevelopment. You might want to call it the mother of gentrification. Napoleon III had a problem with poor people. He was so tired of them rioting and building barricades. So he said, well, let me think, what can I do? I can move you outside the city and I can replace your homes with boulevards. Have you ever tried to build a barricade across a boulevard? It takes a lot of furniture, right? <laughs> exactly. So we love the boulevards. You go to Paris, you walk around and you enjoy your shopping and you think how grand this city is. A lot of Chicago, you know, is modeled on that. But it's about power. It's about preventing people from taking control, and it's also about seeing in the distance. The police could now really have a good sight of line and, and keep things under control. These are the uh, new inhabitants of the 8th arrondissement checking out their new homes and neighborhood. A Paris of change. The Industrial Revolution changes everything, but Paris is changing on its own. It's its own beast. And this is where this change with a Paris that expands brings artists to explore the outskirts. Now, I'm probably going to lose my voice for a second. I'm not going to talk. Where do these artists go? The artists explored in this exhibition? Okay, up there. <laughs> Northwest corner of the city that they can actually reach walking or they can reach in ways that are not quite as time consuming as, as going outside of the city entirely. The northwest part of Paris was being very quickly um, built in, in a way that radically changed the landscape. So lots of factories but also new wealth, new homes uh, appearing and the artists featured in the exhibition were particularly keen to document these transitions from a more kind of genteel countryside reality to the new industrial identity of Paris. And that's what makes the paintings that you will see in the exhibition particularly important. But our question is, how is Van Gogh kind of holding the whole thing together? Why is he the star of this exhibition? Or why wouldn't he be, right? He's like the most famous. But, um, there are really interesting 
moments in the exhibition in which you can see that it's not just the sub that, subject that changes. So, goodbye to Constable Erasing Factories. These artists paint trains, which by the way, as you know, Turner also did in a couple of occasions, but they also paint chimney stacks. They paint a Paris that is changing, that is becoming bigger, that is becoming difficult to live and yet exciting at the same time. So just kind of like review your dates, Impressionism, 1874, 1886. And number 12, we're playing Impressionist Bingo. Didn't they give you the cards? No. What is number 12 in relation to Impressionism? What does it mean? 12 what? 12... Very good, 12 years of Impressionism. Sometimes it feels like it went on forever, right? No, it didn't. They just painted a lot. And number eight. Eight what? Not eight Impressionists. <laughs> many more. Eight exhibitions of Impressionism. Not that many either, right? Like colossal, colossal movement. Now, we know what Impressionism looks like. It's about painting outdoors, painting quickly. If this weekend you want to give it a try, get yourself a canvas, find the pretty view, and give yourself three hours, and you have to finish your painting. Then, like Monet and Seurat, you can bring the painting back to the studio and finish it up a little bit, because it's very hard to be outside and get everything right. But Impressionism tends to really focus on the quality of lighting. It tends to focus on this immediacy of life that classical art had kind of like pushed aside because it was all about beautifying, perfecting, and making things look the best. Impressionism was a lot more subtle in its relationship to color. Impressionist artists refused to use black because black was not a color. And they focused increasingly on reflections of color upon color. Have you seen this painting before? Yes, because it's in our collection. Now, when this was first seen by the critic, by you know, this painting by Pissarro, the critics said, what's going on? It's like butter just flooded the town. They wanted snow to be white, but snow is never truly white not for long anyway, it picks up other colors and it gets dirty. And, and Pissarro wanted to represent that, what he saw with his eyes, not just what classical art says you should paint. Footnote, an important one nonetheless. You all know that Impressionist paintings weren't selling, right? That's common knowledge. Now they're worth in the excess of 50 million each. You know, whenever you walk through the galleries upstairs, you can make, you can play that game. How many millions are surrounding me right now? A lot. Now, this man, Paul de Randruel, was actually the masterminder of Impressionism. In order to get famous as an artist, you need an art historian, a dealer, and a number of good critics who like your work and will write about it in a positive light. There's no other way. Yesterday as, as today. And Durandrell went bankrupt multiple times as he paid stipends to the Impressionists so that they didn't have to work and they could spend their days painting on plein air outside. Isn't that fascinating? But the situation for Van Gogh, Seurat, Signac, and the other artists who worked in a post-Impressionist reality was often very different. Their market was also non-existent. Post-Impressionism begins in 1886, and we can claim it's over by 1905. I really don't have all the time I would need, which is like six hours, to explain to you what these dates really mean and what, what gives us these dates, right? But 1886 is really important, and it's important because of La Grangeat. Now, La Grangeat is a key moment, and I'm going to talk to you about La Grangeat in, in a minute. But first, our history of art. Nugget. Roger Fry. I know you're like, what? Well. <laughs> Roger Fry, influential art historian who masterminded post impressionism. Impressionism and post impressionism are very different things. Impressionism were our famous Renoir, Monet, Pissarro, and many more who gathered together and worked as a movement. 
they actually identified as a movement, one of the very first movements in the history of art. Post-impressionism doesn't work that way. The five artists we're looking at in the exhibition work together in a very loose way, but they, at least they knew each other. But post-impressionism stretches all the way into 1905 because it was theorized by Roger Fry between 1912 and 1913 as he looked back and he's like, hey, all these artists are doing something similar, but they don't have a name together. Get the difference? So to a degree, post-impressionism is crafted by the mind of an art historian, while Impressionism actually existed as a real movement of people who got drunk together. Just remember that. I think it's good information. Now, Van Gogh has this moment, right? We're going to return to the Grand Chat in 1886, but Van Gogh has this moment of incredible realization. You're all familiar with the color palette change, right? The dark Van Gogh, the very colorful Van Gogh. Well, there's a lot to do with the paintings that we see bubbling up around 1884 and 1886 that are painted in the northwest of Paris, right? Anier and La Granja, which is the island in um, the northwest, that change forever the way in which Van Gogh thinks about color. Have you seen this painting? Not in our collection. National Gallery, London. Be nice, I always fantasize about this day. We bring this painting here and kind of like adjoin it to La Grange. but I don't think it will happen somehow. Now, 1886, the end of Impressionism. Why? Because this painting is exhibited at the last Impressionist exhibition, which wasn't meant to be the last. It becomes the last once Monet gets really upset because nobody's looking at his paintings because everyone is looking at this. Because Lagrange was so big, you've seen it, right? It's big, very different from what Monet painted. How did Lagrange get into the last Impressionist exhibition when it is not Impressionism? Because you all know that this is very good. See, you will pass the test. Pointillism. So pointillism, Impressionism, mm, not sure. They got. The guy was organizing all Impressionist exhibition and he was told by the others that he should be a little stricter with the selection process because he was allowing many artists who were friends of his to enter the exhibitions just as a favor. And this was a favor, not to Monet. What happens after this? Impressionism is over. Because clearly this is a statement. It's not just a matter of like Monet getting upset because, you know, nobody looked at my paintings and throwing the toys of the Impressionist prom. It's more about the statement that maybe Impressionism has run its course. And 12 years down the line, if artists, young artists, are inventing a new technique that derives from Impressionism, maybe it means that Impressionism is kind of like dated and that the wind is now blowing in a different direction. Now you all know that post-impressionism, especially pointillism, tends to be a form of torture. <laughs> Have you tried this yourselves? You wanna try this weekend? A few hours aside? Dot, 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 dot. You know, Seurat cheated, right? So if you want to give yourself, you know, embrace the challenge, you, you might want to First, color your fields in a flat hue, let it dry and then go on and dot. It didn't dot the surface as in the white canvas, right? It kind of like created a primer with the right color. Beautiful, you get close to it and you see all the colors separate. You probably remember why, right? It's about brightness. There were many theories of color uh, that were being published at the time. And they claim that the more you mix your pigments, the more the luminosity of the painting will diminish. And to these artists who are competing with photography, you remember photography invented in 1826. By 1839, the whole of Paris is like, photography, photography. And painters are like, well, you know, us, what do we do? We make very colorful paintings so that we can stand out and attract people's attention. And that's where we see also Signac, you know, Seurat and Signac in uh, the northwest corner on River Seine by La Grangeat, invent divisionism and pointillism. Divisionism is 
a lesser form of torture. Right? Divisionism is like, you can see the relationship. You can probably say at a glance, this is kind of almost impressionist. Remember, it's all about the brushwork. The brushstroke of impressionism is long and broken. With divisionism, the brushwork becomes shorter and broken. With pointillism, the brushwork becomes a dot. That's when you start really to suffer. And the color is everything. This is a really interesting quote. You know, like Van Gogh wrote a lot. And the notion that it's when he arrived at Anie that the color began to really speak to him is really important. That's what the exhibition is about. It's about changing the style from this. Do you remember the potato eaters? Dark. Look what a limited, narrow palette he had. And look at the change that eventually happens. Right? This is 1885. Remember, the chronology of Van Gogh is incredible. Like, the man basically paints properly for like six years. Do you know how many works he painted in six years between 1885 and 1890? I take offers. How many? I heard thousands and two hundred. That's good. Two thousand. Roughly two thousand work. Almost a thousand paintings. The rest is sketches, drawings, and you won't want to count the letters, which included little drawings. It's mind-blowing, incredibly prolific. And you will remember, too, his brother Theo, right? We're going to talk about Theo. Do you remember Theo? Younger brother, in love with his brother so deeply, he bankrolled Van Gogh's career, took care of him when Van Gogh was losing his path. By the way, Van Gogh had found his path to become a priest but lost it when he found the brothel instead, <laughs> right? That's how the story goes. And then he became an artist, right? But very few people seem to be aware of the fact that he was also an art dealer, which is kind of shocking. He was a successful art dealer for a few years in London, of all places, became wealthy, knew what he was doing. Then the crisis hit. He believed that Art was being commercialized too much. However, it's all very complicated, because on and off he writes to Theo, like when he's painting the sunflowers, and he says, oh, these are really going to work with the British market. So he was still aware of it, and he wanted to sell his paintings, but at the same time he was very critical of it. So he also stops, uh, brings his career as a, um, an art dealer to an end. And you know, he only sold one painting in his lifetime for the equivalent of 20 bucks. So, you know... Sometimes it's hard to kind of like find linearity in the lives of these artists. But Theo held it all together, and this is not like the last of the twists and turns that I'm going to reveal today. Sarah, wonderful young artist, uh, also spent too much time at the brothel, dies of syphilis. Invents pointillism in collaboration with Signac, works on divisionism. You will see some of his works in the exhibition. And it, he is responsible for much of the change in the palette uh, range. And a lot of this change comes from Japanese woodblock prints. Van Gogh amassed a collection of over 200 of them in a very short period of time. These could be found in Paris roughly starting from the 1850s after Japan opened um, trade with, with the rest of the world. And the colors the vibrancy, the juxtaposition of warm and cold color inspired Van Gogh to no end. So you see this very interesting, very strange journey from Japanese woodblock print, from Seurat Signac, the artist that he encounters in the northwest corner of Paris, creating this revolution in his mind. Finally, the understanding that color is everything. Like I said earlier, color was central to the conversation of impressionists and post-impressionists because the color wheel had been invented. Do you remember the color wheel? So much fun, right? You look at it, you, you finally have control over your colors and you know what to juxtapose what with. Fascinating and liberating for so many artists who finally could look at reality and represent reality without having to look at other people's paintings. We often forget how much 
restrictions were imposed upon classical artists because the idea was that you always had to look at Raphael, you always had to look at Michelangelo, and then you had to kind of find your style through their style. But at this point, these artists are like, no, I'm just kind of like experimenting, pushing the boundaries. That's the avant-garde, right? And Clausenism, different. You can see again, related to Impressionism to a certain degree, but the outline that uh, we see in these works sets it apart. Cloisonism doesn't get talked about much, uh, as much as Impressionism, but this is also where artists like Gauguin and Picasso will come from. It's not just the post-Impressionism of Seurat that seeds the path, that marks the path for the future. Bernard was incredibly influential to Van Gogh's practice. And of course, when I say Gauguin, one of the most famous paintings in which you can see the use of the black outline, the flat colors that we see already being pioneered by Bernard. And of course, Angand, who, as you can see, pushed pointillism to a very rarefied extreme. All these influences play very strongly on Van Gogh and this change of direction. There are very interesting contribution, the contributions that the, exhibitions, the exhibition brings to the fore, and some of them entail bringing together works of art that had been previously separated and scattered away. These were meant to be part of a triptych. Archiving Van Gogh's paintings, it's incredibly, incredibly complicated because the man wasn't like organizing them. I'm going to reveal to you at the end of the lecture who was responsible for organizing his work and for really creating Van Gogh, because it, this is also part of the story that doesn't really get told. Beautiful works by Seurat that you will see in the uh, exhibitions, works that have not seen each other for a very long time. You know, sometimes exhibitions also work this kind of magic, works that were made at the same time or nearby, uh, just happen to go in different places around the world, so you will have the opportunity to actually see them next to each other. I was actually at the Met just a couple of days ago. There's a beautiful exhibition at the Met. Can I mention the Met? I'm sure, right? Yeah. <laughs> Museums, politics. Um, Van Gogh's Cypresses, right? So the exhibition gathers together all these paintings of Cypresses. It's a great companion to this exhibition, I claim. This might be the last time you see me here, by the way. <laughs> Talking about the Met at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, gorgeous exhibition. You really see the obsession. The man was obsessed. You know, if you have an obsession, cultivate it, because that's what life is about, really. Uh, you can really see how those gears were turning. Do you know this painting? Good, yes, yes is the answer, because it's in our collection, correct. This is the Poet's Garden, and I just wanted to show it to you. It's not part of the time period that it's ex explored by the exhibition. If you... doesn't ring a bell, like, I don't remember this one, go see it, right? It's in our Van Gogh room. Um, gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. The use of color, the brushwork, right? Van Gogh really revolutionized his sensitivity towards color and how color can communicate so much. How color becomes the essence, the soul of his work. He had an argument with his brother Theo. He didn't tell you, by um, 1886, when Van Gogh arrives in um, Paris, Theo and, and, and Vincent share um, an apartment. And after a little while, Theo's like, I can't stand it. And the two have to go separate ways, but then, you know, brotherly love returns and they're happy again. But it's so incredible. The argument apparently was generated by this disagreement where Theo was telling him, go brighter, go more colorful, go more bold. And Van Gogh was still, still kind of like faithful to his darker tones. And Theo believed that Van Gogh was kind of struggling to catch up with the, you know, the newer kind of avant-garde, and he wanted him to. And then eventually he goes beyond the avant-garde. And that's one of the reasons why his paintings don't sell, right? Because they're too out of the box, too out there for people to really understand the importance of the innovation. Right? Innovation is always tricky. Innovation is always challenging. But before I let you go to experience the beauty of the exhibition, we owe 
Johanna van der Bonger, her minute of glory. So many people ask me all the time, so if Van Gogh didn't sell a painting, or only one, in his lifetime, how did he become the most famous artist of the post-impressionist period? Of, you can argue, modern art itself. Her. How many of you have heard about Johanna before? Exactly. <laughs> See why? You know, it's a cliche that behind a great man, great man there's always a great woman. True. <laughs> so true. So unfortunately, the story kind of goes, it's a little tragic, you know, because uh, in 1890, Van Gogh dies, and you will remember that, um, the death is all kind of like a mystery. You will read in many sources that it was a suicide, but there are, there's a few other versions that claim that he was killed, there was an accident, so we will not know exactly what happened. But uh, Van Gogh dies prematurely, and unfortunately Theo dies six months later. So poor Johanna is left alone, and she has a one-year-old to feed and to take care of. And she also has almost a thousand canvases by Van Gogh in the basement. She looks at them, she looks at them, she asks Gauguin, like, do you think you can do something? What can I do with these canvases? And Gauguin is like, I'm going to Tahiti. <laughs> he was like, if you read Gauguin's letters, he was always claiming that he was the greatest artist in the world. He was so humble, Gauguin, right? <laughs> so do you think Gauguin was going to spend a minute promoting Van Gogh? For what reason? To even chance that Van Gogh's fame one day could be greater than Gauguin, which I think it kind of is the case. If you had to choose, if I were to give you a Gauguin or a Van Gogh, which one would you take? Yeah? Okay. Anyway, how does it go? Well, Johanna had this incredible entrepreneurial ability, and she understood something that still many artists today don't understand without having to go to, through 30 years of bashing their heads against the wall, wondering, why is it that my career is never taking off? Because you are not navigating the field like you should. How should you do it? Well, Johanna learned how to become a representative, an art dealer, how to weave conversations. Just imagine somebody who's not an artist, somebody who's not necessarily coming from a background that entails a lot of engagement with the cultural world, spending time with artists, relocating multiple times in order to be involved in artistic communities, on and off, coincidentally, pulling out of the handbag a painting by Van Gogh, saying, what do you think of this one? Right? <laughs> Putting away, okay. And continuing for years and years, trying to connect with the right people, just like art dealers do today, using the internet, and spending time cultivating the persona of Van Gogh. And eventually things start to, one thing start to lead to another. And the myth of Van Gogh begins to build almost entirely because of her. She needed the money, right? She needed to shift this, like, almost a thousand canvases. She could see the dollar signs in the basement. She said, we need to get this out there. And of course, the making of an artist is always more than money, right? She believed in, in Van Gogh's greatness, but with that came her future. And then an art historian, then another, began to kind of like, uh, you're right, these are really great paintings. In 1901, 1901, that's over 10 years, 11 years she had to work to get to a retrospective, the first retrospective of Van Gogh. But then she's not done with the work. You would think, okay, well, she's done it. Can you imagine, like, I just want to rewind the tape. Somebody who is not in the field, learning how to become an art dealer, roping in art historians, doing all the connect, lining up all the connections so that there is a retrospective of Van Gogh. And then she's like, something is missing. What is that something? The letters. Because the myth of a great artist of this caliber, of Van Gogh's caliber, is not complete 
without biographical information. And she had all these beautiful letters, she started to go through them, and then they were eventually published. Just before World War I, that's when Van Gogh started to really hit the big time across culture. And it's around the time the book of letters was, was first published. So you can look at this trail and really see the, the guide. If any of you want to take up the career of art dealer, I would certainly read her biography and how she must remind it every single move in order to make Van Gogh happen. On that note, it's been a pleasure to spend the afternoon with you. It's probably time now for me to have my slice of cake. I don't know if there's any left. But yes, thank you very much and enjoy the exhibition. Thank you.